Today, we are going through high ticket and low ticket. So if you're an agency owner, we're gonna be covering how to price, where to get started, and what this looks like at scale. So one of the biggest things when we speak to agency owners is a lot of them are kind of stuck selling low ticket and they kind of feel forced into that. But we know that like the biggest opportunity for agency owners is going high ticket. Can you just describe the di one, like what do you define as that? And then why do you see this as such a big opportunity? High ticket in services, I think is like different high ticket in coaching. High ticket in coaching would be like a 10, 15, 20K one-off project. But with info becoming more and more available, info is becoming almost less valuable. There's so much good stuff being put out on YouTube for free now. And what the real benefits of service for an agency is that there's a done for you element and a done for you component within there. So you have to exchange some time investment for money in return. So that creates a need to charge more so you can get a good return for your time. So I would define a, a high ticket agency at a minimum of 5K per month. Any lower than that, single service, you're still gonna make some money, but if you wanna get some really good results, delivering just a single service in business is gonna be hard. Um, I would class a low ticket agency anywhere up to say 3K per month. That's how I would classify and define it. And just mentioning the challenge that I think a lot of people are facing, it's because they're selling to people who don't have real businesses. So they're trying to sell to people who are making less than a million dollars per month. So if you're selling to someone who's only making a million dollars per year, so if you're selling to someone who's only making 50K per month and you're charging five or 10K per month, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of that. It's like 10, could be 20% of their overall revenue that you're charging. But if you're selling to a company that's making 10 million, it's such small amount, so it's, it's very relative. So I would class that as a higher ticket from an agency perspective. And unless you have a large brand, a large following, or a really scalable delivery mechanism that can get results, and that's a key component, I think it makes sense to start trying to close higher ticket projects because you can have less of them and make more, not just more revenue, more profits from that. And you've experienced doing lead generation and sales to lower value clients. It's very hard. It's very hard to take money off someone yeah. who doesn't have a lot of money. But companies who have money, who are already looking to invest and they're just selecting the best option, all you're doing is you're aligning with the strategy and making sure that they fit within there. Yeah, and the real, the real secret to making a lot of money online is to sell to people who have money, right? So like when you're selling B2C versus B2B, you say, well, like who's going to have more money, right? Like your, your average person or businesses. And then it's like, it's the same thing when you go in, like when, once you know it's business, it's like, great, well, who has more money in the businesses? It's obviously not the micro and the small businesses. You're looking more upwards, like you said, that one to 10 million. And I think one of the reasons people get trapped at that 3k a month is because they are constantly speaking to those smaller businesses so then when you speak to them they're like oh well, i have no money he's like, oh it must be my problem i need to, to drop it but i also think like one of the big issues is a lot of people still see it as like a service so like oh i'm an agency i'm going to deliver like a service but like actually it's kind of the wrong mindset and it keeps again it keeps you kind of trapped at that lower ticket price point so for you like how do you define the two differences and what switches can people make to go from maybe if they're selling a service now into selling some sort of offer where they can eventually go and charge or even right now go and charge those high ticket prices? It starts with the sales process and speaking to people. I think we get sold like it needs to be, like you said, a service of I run ads or I do this thing and that limits you and creates a lot of competition. Whereas if you speak to a prospect and you really do a deep discovery, a lot of our partners and even ourselves, I just did an in-person proposal after two discovery calls. So by the time, and I revised that proposal after the in-person proposal. So I did an initial discovery call, then Matt, our managing director, did a deeper dive after we signed a non-disclosure agreement to go deeper into the details of their business. 
Then I did an in-person proposal. Then I revised that proposal based on feedback. So there's like four pitches to get the, the deal over the line. And even though we have services that quote unquote work, what I was able to do is customize how we deliver those services into an offer based on the client's needs. And that's the missing main piece of the jigsaw that a lot of people miss. It's like, oh, I already know what I'm selling to you before I've even had the conversation. So, so tactically, like, what does that look like? You said, yeah, you know, yeah. you have you have four meetings. Yeah. But how would someone right now who who is selling a service, what could they do in their next sales call or whatever it is yeah. to to transition? Don't that? pitch. <laughs> like the major thing is actually not pitching because if you're not super experienced in sales and you're going on to an initial meeting and you feel like you have to pitch a service and pitch a price and get it over the line, there's so much like fear <laughs> and worry. Yeah. So I would just take a step back, work on helping them, helping them to communicate with you well by learning, understand their business, asking probing questions. What can you give a couple of examples? Where they want to be where they are now in terms of revenue projects what they're doing in terms of maybe lead generation sales what their major constraints what their bottlenecks are who they're looking to hire what's not working well what are the competitors are doing what are they fearful about what's challenging what big events are coming up what new emerging markets are they looking into what products are they launching if you get that information some of our clients literally brought us on board just to end that into new geographical areas. So that one thing was a major need. And then what, once you un uncover what those like one or two things are, you build then the proposal around this. So a client, a prospect the other day, they had a, I wouldn't say a problem, but based on their close rate, I know that if we change the people in the process, we can double their close rate quite easily. And that to their business would double the revenue, but it would 5X their profits. So for their enterprise value, it's so much larger. So I'm not trying to sell everything. What I'm sharing is I will help you solve that big constraint, that big problem by doing a range of things. And how do you identify that? Because yeah, cool, yeah. you've asked all these questions. They got all this answer. Like, how does someone who's never done this before be like, oh, that's the thing? And then how do they then take that and sell that? You have ChatGPT now. Like, ChatGPT is very smart. You can literally put that in in terms of, I've asked the client all of these questions. This is their goal based on them trying to get there. What are the areas of which they need to improve? And you'll get really high quality answers now. If you don't know, you need to start leveraging really basic and simple AI to improve. And it's not to say that, okay, it gives me this answer and I copy and paste it. No, but it could give you like one or two ideas, one or two concepts where you're like, oh, I could run with this. So for example, they might be doing ads and they've got no organic content. So we go, okay, well, I can, even if you're not saying that you're going to make them a ton of money, you can say, we'll help build you some organic content. So then when you're running ads and people click on your profile, it looks really good. So it could be something as simple as that. And you know, people are paying seven, eight, 10K per month for founder-led marketing, which is basically organic content creation, like taking clips of these sort of podcasts, mm. putting them out there, editing them, making them look good, putting them out on LinkedIn, on YouTube. I would really look at customizing the offer as much as possible. In, in your market, you speak a lot about identification, right? It's not just about creating a bigger and better offer. Whereas the industry that we're in, like growth services in general, you're just seeing offers getting more and more crazy. And okay, well, how do you counterbalance that? Because a lot of people are scared to put guarantees if they don't know if their service will work. Well, the way of which you counterbalance needing to make crazy guarantees and offers is around actually sharing a proposal that a client really buys into. They buy into the process because you've built it in line with their North Star, where they want to get to. And if the client buys into you and they buy into your process to help them to get results, the deal becomes very easy. Yeah, it's actually one of the, it's level five market sophistication and breakthrough advertising for all you marketing nerds like me out there. But essentially when the market gets so sophisticated, when it gets so competitive, 
the only way that you can stand out versus everyone else is there's, there's two things. So the first one is the unique mechanism, which for us, we, we talk about the process because now that unique mechanism, everyone kind of knows that it's just like, it's, it's not real, right? But the, the process in itself of actually getting results and taking someone step by step is very important. And when you customize that, it becomes even more clear that actually, well, if we just followed this process, I can see how I can get from where they are to where they want to be, right? And the other part you said is the identification piece. And this becomes very, very important at that level of sophistication. It's actually the highest level. This is how you counter it, is by having something that other people can buy into in terms of, oh, I can see myself with this. I can see that customization that's been built into this. And I can almost visualize it in, in that sense. So everything, we just, those two points there, like I think it's one of the biggest points that's missing from marketing and sales in general. Now let me ask you, because one of the things there is like, yeah, this is great, but Jordan, what if I'm sitting there and I actually, like I don't know a lot of stuff, like I've only done. Okay, this is great. So two <laughs> points. Uh, we just started working with a guy called Austin. We started working with him on Tuesday. He already closed two deals just by watching our free stuff. And he's about to close two more. And he's been in since Tuesday. So there's enough information online to take action. And he was like, I wish I'd have joined earlier because I would have actually charged more for the things that I'm doing. And now he's updating some of the proposal. Now he's got access to our team and, and, and the insights, right? So there's enough information online. So you're not missing insights anymore. You're missing action. That's major. And the other areas to this is when we speak about market sophistication, right? And this is where the everyone should work with creators and the growth operator side. That's a really nice business model for people who are maybe either one really good at marketing or are delivering specialist services to creators, which might be like the build out the community or something like that. But first of all, the amount of money that creators have in comparison to business owners is tiny. And also, because they're not real businesses, most of them are just independent. They might have one team member, a couple of team members. And the big creators, most of them know how to market better than you, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Whereas big business owners who are doing like digital transformation or recruitment or education technology, they're not really thinking about marketing and sales. They're thinking about building elements and part of their business. So you it's don't- a switch, isn't it? Like creators- focus on the marketing and yeah. b businesses focus on the, b the business and the product. Yeah. So it's like, there's, there's an easier path with which one you're going to choose, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's super easy. And like, I get it. Like it's, it seems cool if you're young to, oh, like I'll just work with a creator and you know, we, we can make loads of money together and, and drive Lamborghinis. And like some do that, but it's a really small percentage, but there's a lot of businesses out there who are really struggling to find good marketeers and and good people right and um pete and james have just documented their case study and they shared their insights with some of our other clients literally last night and these are two guys who they've now partnered together through working with us james just out of college in his words broke had went traveling for a bit put all of his money into working with us pete had done some digital marketing but now he doesn't do the digital market and he actually does the sales, right? So very low experience still. So they both had very little to no experience. They've signed four deals, all of them at over 100K per month, all with setup fees, 100K per year, sorry, all with setup fees, all with fixed fees, all with revenue shares. And one of their clients is a like partner slash, they're a real partner and has been co-invested in the project with monday.com like they're working with stock listed companies who have a way more money than majority of creators online so the high ticket opportunity is there within business even if you don't have a ton of experience does that mean low tickets worthless and you don't have other offers that can help lead into your higher ticket or that you can cross out of course have them for sure but going back to what Hermosi always used to pitch, one niche, one offer, right? One product to get to the first million. 
and that's absolutely still there now m more than ever right but that offer has to be attractive which we um which which i think everyone knows like every even the service has to be attractive but when you're charging 5 10 15 20k per month there's a very high profit margin in there to do other things within the business like hire a team so you can start to deliver really good services when you're at two three k one k per month there's not as high margins in there so you're gonna have to bring a lot of clients on board have to manage them and we see that all the time like there's there's so many agents who are like on paper look good they may be 100k 200k 300k a month but like when you dig a little bit under the surface it's like yeah, they have a lot of top line revenue, but because they're selling these services, like you said, for one, two, three grand a month, yeah, it's like actually like their profit margins are like almost the same as drop shipping, right? And like service based businesses, you don't need to have that kind of issue if you price correctly. And I think it's actually one of the what the, the biggest mistake people make is pricing. If you get that wrong, like it's it's not an enjoyable business to run. Like it is really not. It's it's kind of like crippling. And I. I did it for a while at those kind of lower price points. And the problem is like either you work all the time, like literally all the time. <laughs> I remember um, I was literally talking to my girlfriend last night and we like, we'd stay up to like 1 a.m. just working on stuff like multiple times a week. And then we'd wake up and just do it all over again. And we just constantly do that and do that and do that. And it just doesn't end. And it's like, that's not an enjoyable business to run. And the side part of that is that you just have to build a big team to manage that and like, Again, if you're not someone who's built a team before, like it's very challenging. It's a whole nother ball game that you don't well, even... As, as well, if you don't have margin, you, you're literally hiring people who need handled and who then take up more of your time. But I just want to make this last point that I want to ask you more about the lead generation side of it because even if you do grow at the start, when you start scaling, the unit economics need to be so much better. So... But before that, um, I want to share one of our new partners is a fairly large business. They're doing about 400K per month in their service base agency. And the challenge that they have is, like you mentioned, is, is the margin. And the core reason for that is because they're delivering a really good product. They're delivering <laughs> the ads, the SDRs, all, all of the stuff that is required to grow the business. The brands that they have are blue chip brands, right? Household names. But because they haven't got the pricing right, the and service-based projects can be a bottomless pit. It's not like, oh, it takes a month or it takes this amount. If it goes wrong, you have to keep putting more and more into it. And that's where, when you've got high ticket and a revenue share, it gives you that, I'm not even going to say a safety blanket. It literally gives you the margin if there is some challenges where you can eat into the margin and you still make nice money. And then as the project gets successful, that margin just continues to expand. It's also like incentive. So like, let's say you're, let's say you start with a client on like two grand a month, right? And then a year later, let's say hypothetically, you're still working that yeah. client, which is, as we know, like, when you when you can't really deliver good service because you're charging not a lot, like it's hard to maintain them as it is. But it's like you're a year better, but you're still getting paid the same price. Yeah. So it's very easy just to be like, oh, well, like actually, it's not really. Yeah, you just hate the business. Yeah. Like so, it's like when you have the margin, you have the upside. It's like actually, like, I'm invested in this as well as you being invested in this, and together, there's a very powerful partnership that can take place where you can really drive business forward. Like at a very significant pace, like when we partnered and we, what we were able to do in the last two years. Yeah. So on the sales side, and I, I want to be very realistic so we don't sound like we're trying to create this you know, utopia and idealistic business that can't be achieved. If your goal is to build a highly profitable business at the start, selling high ticket is the first right next step but once you start targeting that what you're going to find is you're going to start having conversations with people who are interested in working with you but they don't have the budget or they don't fully trust you yet or the, there's there's things that might not make them want or can invest in the high ticket 
boom. That's when you do a downsell, and that's when you can have a lower ticket offer, which we name an automatic upgrade, that you can bring them on at a lower price, over deliver for them within the first one to two months, and then ascend that client into the higher ticket. And there is going to be occasions where that client actually isn't the right fit. And some of the reasons what they were worried about was a reality and doesn't work out. And then that client might off board, right? That client might churn. It might be your decision. It might be the client's decision. But if you don't go for the gold and the lower tickets, your default, it's going to be really hard to scale upwards. And you always default to what's easiest. And that, like, let's be honest, it is easier to sell someone on a grand than it is to sell someone on you know, five grand. If they, ha yeah, if if the offer is the same, but if the offer is not the same, it's actually easier to sell someone on something they want because these business owners have more money than they have time. So that's that's where that's what they're judging. They're already making these investments. So if you can just be a more compelling investment, what they're already paying, and there is lots of different things that you can do. Like a lot of our revenue comes from cross sales, right? That could be placement of sales development reps or salespeople or marketers into their business. You could help them do a HubSpot build out, right? There's other components that you can cross sell and increase the lifetime value of the client. Also, like I mentioned, downsell. There is also upsells that you can do. So there's so many opportunities once you start working with good clients. But if you're not working with a good client, you can't get those opportunities. A word of warning <laughs> to anyone who's watching this, including ourselves, is to not be short-sighted on trying to get the quick hits and the quick wins. And I go back to basically fundamental business models. And we'll switch over after this to the lead generation side of this. But from a unit economic side of the business, and if you look at the majority of successful businesses in the world and people who actually have achieved great things, a huge amount of focus is on the lifetime value. So if you're optimizing just for short-term cash, by like, I'll just bring a client on, deliver this thing for three months and they'll churn, doesn't matter because I've made X amount of money. First of all, you're probably going to get a bad reputation by doing that because if you say, even if you say, look, I'm going to build this thing for you and you have to manage it and they don't get results, they're still going to blame you, right? Because they've still made an investment in something that they don't deem works. Even if you've delivered something's good, if they can't use it, they're not going to be pleased, right? So if you're delivering a holistic offer, what you have more influence in supporting them to get results, where you can manage the relationship, that relationship is going to go on. And yeah, in occasions, it might be suitable to do these lower tickets offers, right? Or the high ticket ones. But if you have that real core component there and then use these as almost like added value parts to your business to boost your revenue up rather than make it the main business, that's, you're, you're going to build a very successful business. And like Hamozi, when he talks about gym launch, he was like, I wish I hadn't charged as much. I wish I had charged less and kept them on for a longer period of time based on what his offer is. Obviously, if you can charge as much, keep them on longer, that's even better because the lifetime value increases. But if you're not optimizing for high lifetime value and trying to at least make 100K per client, you're gonna struggle with the unit economics as you start to scale. Obviously, you run our ads, so you're dialed into the high rows and the, the dashboards and the data at a way deeper level than I am, thank God. So can you go through, because it's there's, in my understanding, there's two types of you running ads and scaling ads, and it's it's very different. So can you just share, okay, well, at the start, if you run lead gen or ads, you, <laughs> this is okay, but if you want to really scale to the multiple millions, you need to make sure that these metrics are in line. Can, can you just share what's important? Yeah, I think like it's important to understand where to take a step back first before I get into it, it's like the advertising game is getting harder. So it's like, Why? because it's just more competitive. So right now, as in like going into 2025, there are 
thousands, like hundreds of thousands of advertisers on Meta, probably hundreds of millions at this point. And they're all competing for the same eyeballs. There's no, there's no more eyeballs, right? And so what ends up happening is like- As more kids. <laughs> well, <laughs> birth rates are down as well, yeah. so we're really screwed. <laughs> but the problem is like, when you have all these people come on, Facebook is like, okay, well, I'm just gonna jack your price up. And every year, like as a business, every single year, Meta increases the CPMs, which is the price they're gonna charge you because they're a business, they wanna make more money. So even if there wasn't more advertisers, they'd probably still charge you more, right? But when there is more advertisers, that gets jacked up, then they're also jacking it up. So the price from like five years ago has probably like quadrupled, if not more, for that they're gonna charge you. So Meta is basically this like silent partner. So just the cost business. for someone to see your ad yeah. and then, is essentially so four So when you combine that with then how creative people have got, like if you look now, we are in, a very much a creator economy in, in many points where you know there's there's just an abundance of content and with chat gpt it's going to be like the, there's going to be ai content soon so you're just going to be in one of the most thank god <laughs> i'll take saturday afternoons off <laughs> so you're going to have probably one of the most competitive two of the most competitive things when you have paid when you're competing with the advertisers and organic so then it's like not only do you have to be better as an advertiser, you also have to be better than the organic people to get people to watch. So the level of standard that it takes has gone up. Now, the problem is when you sell low ticket is that, well, actually you don't have any room to mess up. You literally, like if you mess up and you don't, if you're not perfect at ads, you will not be able to make low ticket work full stop, like categorically. Now, if you're really good, there may be some instances, but I'm talking like really, really good. Back in the day, you could be bang average and you could make a 5X. Now it's just not the case. And you see a lot of these e-com brands, they go negative to be able to then sell on the back end. But like if you're just getting started, you don't have that luxury. It's not possible. Where you take high ticket now, it's like from an economic standpoint, the math just makes more sense. Can you break down simple math? Yeah, so let's say you're gonna sell someone for like the, the 100K, right? So that's, that's the end goal, that's, that's the LTV that we're trying to get. Now, from an advertising perspective, let's say on average, worst case, it's gonna cost you like $300 to get a call, a decent call. Now, take into the fact that show rates are down because of the competition, like $600 per call. Showed up. Showed up call. Now, let's say you have a 20% close rate, which is like fairly normal, especially in a big deal like that. That's gonna be another $3,000 to acquire a customer, right? So now that one customer at 3K, is gonna make you 100K. So from a margin perspective, it's not like too bad. Now- So that's the CAC to LTV Exactly. Ratio. Now the problem is, that's very normal at the start. When you turn on ads to start with, Facebook is so, so good. You just find these like little micro pockets of exactly who you should be targeting. If you're spending $100 a day, very likely you're gonna get those kind of results. But as you scale, the problem is that the maths, like Facebook has to go to a colder and colder and colder audience. So, so that's up, people who are like, not just, as good as a fit, less interested. Yeah, they just, they just aren't as ready to buy from you. So what happens is that CAC starts to creep up. Now, if you only were selling a service for three grand a month. Why does, it, why does the cost require customer keep creeping up? Okay, well, let's say you go to someone and they're in the market to buy a car. Hmm. Great, I'll take the car instantly. Let's say you go to someone who's like not even thinking about buying mm. a car. You have to convince them firstly yeah. to buy a car. Then you have to convince them to buy your car. So they're less likely to click on the ad. They're less likely to show exactly. up. They're less so likely to close. So the, the metrics, metrics just start, start decreasing. Dropping down, yeah. right? So then it's like, okay, well, if you are only selling for three grand, low ticket, you can't, like, you literally can't afford to, to run the ads. Run the ads. Yeah. With high ticket, now you can keep spending which means at scale, you can spend more than everyone else to acquire a customer, which Dan Kennedy is one of the godfathers of marketing said, the person who wins is the person who can spend the most to acquire a customer. And when you sell high ticket, you can keep spending where everyone else is priced out. And over the next two or three years, you're gonna see more and more people being priced out, even being able to think about running ads. So as a result, you're one of the only people left, you can clean up, take a much bigger part of the market and continue to scale and spend. As well, those numbers we just said, like that's if you're good. Like if you're terrible, like you don't like if you're like let's say you're not good at sales. Let's say you're not good at building the infrastructure past the ad level, right? Yeah. And there's a lot that goes into it. Like 
pre-call, yeah, post SDR, call, sales funnel, dilemma. sales letters. There's a, it's not just that. So it's like, there's a lot of things you have to do to get that in line to get those kind of metrics. Mm. Where if you're not that good, maybe you're not quite there. You could have a lower than a 50% show rate right now. You could be closing at 5%, 10% on those kind of bigger ticket deals if you've not done it before. So it's like, so you have to have that wiggle room to get good. Because that's the thing. If you're just starting, you will get good over time. But you have to just play the game for long enough to get good enough to be able to really scale and, and, and go up. And that's why for me, it's like from a, just a pure economic standpoint, it literally makes no sense to go low ticket in comparison to yeah. high ticket. But also in that funnel, not everyone's going to be the ideal potential prospect yeah. other. No. So you're going to have the option to downsell them as well. Yeah, so if absolutely. you're promoting an offer that is for, let's just say companies between five to 15 million per year and your offer is 100K, you're going to get people clicking through who are not yeah, that, 100%. but they like what you have to offer. So you and always have the option to downsell. Yeah, and that's one of the, we, we recently ran a test on this. So what we do is we financial call a say, okay, well, look, Jordan, are you this kind of target company we're going after? Do you make 5 million or more? And if they say, no, I don't make 5 million, we had another question that says, are, are you willing to invest X amount, right? And that X amount could be like, let's say three grand or five grand for a downsell. Now you're basically getting a list of people who are primed for your downsell. So you're not even having to waste time necessarily trying to go through this whole thing and pay me 100 grand when they don't have it. Yeah. So then you can downsell them. We implemented this a couple of growth partners and they've sold like three or four downsells in like a week just from having that because they, they're, they're really focused on that. And that's like, again, what that does is from a pure mass basis, that kind of liquidates the ad spend so you can continue to spend more money and even increase those profit margins again. And it really makes running ads one way more profitable but also like it takes away a lot of the risk that people associate with having to spend money out and give her meta so much of the the capital every single month i want to touch on one additional point here in terms of a massive benefit that i see is when you work with a good client there's a higher likelihood that you're going to get referrals that you're going to get good results that you're going to get a good case study and if you have that case study, it's likely that you're going to attract more and more clients like that. Whereas if you do the down sales and case studies are so crucial. Especially so if now. If yeah, you're yeah. only working with someone for two, three months and yeah, you might make 10, 15 K off them. But if they don't have a good experience, then you start to get more deals coming through and they're like, oh, like, who are you working with? Can we speak to the customers? How many clients you have on board? And you don't have those things and you've been going a year or two. You've, you're going to lose deals. Is yeah, his money just gone. Yeah, you've, well, you've burnt your reputation and you only get one of those things. I think as well with the those kind of more successful companies to me, and it's kind of interesting when I look at it, it's like they just have longer time frames that they're operating from. So when you're talking about LTV, like people are like, oh, you know, why would a company pay me for a year? I say, well, it's just very normal. It's like the most normal kind yeah. of contract in B2B that you could ever get. Yeah. And uh, it was like, oh. Annual licenses for software. It, Any it, it, software is a yeah. It makes me laugh so much as well. Because everyone's like, oh, you know, they just cancel the contract. Like, no, that's yeah. not what big businesses do. Maybe small businesses are used to them. What's the software company that a lot of people use and they're, they're really strict with their contracts. Oh, my, your dad signed yeah, up. Yeah, my dad signed up uh, one of the data companies. Not seamless. It was... And one of the big ones, aren't yeah, they? Like 15k per yeah, year or something 15, for them? Yeah, so my, my dad signed up to it. It cost him like 24 grand for the year. He used it for a day and then it went... Like he bought it like on the 30th of December. Then it hit the first of Jan and he was like, oh, I'm going to cancel this because they had it. He's like, oh, sorry, it's been the next year. You're not able to. Because it automatically yeah, like enrolls. It was just in the next year, so he locked him in. He's now in a legal battle with them, trying to get out of paying them because he didn't use the product in the first place. And it's just like, this is like, that is how they operate. The same thing, like Seamless do it, all the big data companies do it, and all the big tech companies do it because it's like, well, yeah, that's like 20 grand that we're going to use and think about how much that adds to the valuation every single time. So it's like, it's so normal for these big companies, but it's like, just because you're not used to contracts doesn't mean the rest of the world isn't, that's like how everyone operates. It's yeah. literally a legally binding yeah. document. That, that was one of the biggest, well, I, I think probably like one of the craziest things that I recognize about this industry is just 
how little people understood about basic business fundamentals of having contracts in place, having relationships in place, yeah. having cash flow projections in place, because it seems to be people are doing different offers almost every single week to try to just like grab as much quick cash as possible. And it's not to say that you shouldn't be testing different things. Or you can't test different things, but the test should be towards trying to build more things that are more sustainable rather than just testing things to try to make money within the next month or two. Yeah, it's just switching from a short-term view to a long-term, right? But I think a lot of the people in this space are so focused on the now. And it's also, this what people are teaching them on. Like, this, this mm. is the problem. Like they're, they're only going as far as they're being educated to do. Yeah, but look at all the big info marketers. They're all switching now towards bigger businesses, older school businesses. Yeah, I saw... Um, Ty Lopez, Grant Cardone, um, they, Dean, Graziosi. Dean Graziosi, they're all like, oh, we want to go after contractors and blue collar. And it's like, they're all moving because that's where the money is, yeah. where everyone thinks the money is in info. And it's funny, like, let's go to info, right? <laughs> Compared to the B to B in the contracts. It's like, everything is now, 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 money yeah. now, money now, money now. There's no recurring, there's no contracts. It's just like, they want the money now. In comparison, so it's like, if you are looking well, at it's why every big info person switches. Yeah. Alex Becker switched. Sam Ovens switched. Amozi kind of switched. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, that's the kind of interesting thing to me about the growth operators. Like a lot of people think there's, there's a lot of money in that. But actually, like on almost every single metric, it's worse. <laughs> there's a lot of money in school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of money for school involved in that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And Emoji is a great market. Yeah, so. their, their enterprise value is going crazy. <laughs> Are you singing growth up yeah, right well, up on the rooftop well, if I well, were a bigger business who's doing the long term contracts yeah. and keeping people in and Yeah, I don't know. I think that there's there's just like a missed opportunity there for a lot of people. And I think the people who are able to just like kind of identify that early. And move because the people who are, who are doing the info are going to notice. They are eventually going to move. Yeah, for sure. See it's not going to work. Well, it's, it's it's happening now. And if you look at the people who do make a lot of money, it's the people who can become the category king or queen within their demographic and marketplace because they can have multiple offers, cross sells, different products, even separate businesses, but they understand they own they become that key person of influence within the market they start to understand the niche they build connections in the niche they start to be able to customize stuff more and more for the market of which they're working in and i think if you're in marketing learning and i'm really pleased that you do majority of it but learning from good direct response market as learning from info market as learning from creators of how they're doing the youtube videos but then apply that to all the businesses There's like an arbitrage there yeah sure. well that but we were doing it two and a half years ago and it's still there yeah yeah because they're so far behind that's the thing eh? when you go look at the talent there in those businesses it's just they're just so far behind so the only thing they can do is work with outside people to be able to like bring them up a notch but they just move so slowly like it and it's like yeah if you can bring just a bit of energy and a bit of the new insights, if you could go to our YouTube channel, take all the content from our YouTube channel and go plug that into someone else's business, that kind of a, a bit of an older business, the, the gap there is just like so exponentially big that they will instantly get more results. And obviously if you have a revenue share, et cetera, you take home more. But even us who understand marketing, who have a community of marketers, who have direct relationships with great marketers, we hire multiple types of high ticket agencies slash growth partners in our business to work with us because it's so hard to attract good marketers. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like all the, basically the entire marketing team now is outside because the few people who are really good at what they do, you just can't get them anymore. And it's, that's the opportunity. But for, we're not for unique you. in that. All of our, no. like our friends are doing the exact same. They'll work with an expert on 
add creatives or email list or something like that. And it normally is around, yes, they've got a specialty in a single service, but because they can bridge their business together, they're able to charge so much more. And most, most people are taking a revenue share. Yeah. Like it's not unusual. And I do think that like, again, managing expectations, if you're going to businesses that are above 40, 50 million, maybe even 25 million, it's going to be harder to get a revenue share. But you can get commission paid very easily. Yeah. I was going to say, though, even just adding a revenue share to me is a win-win. Because if you think about it, right, if someone comes to you and say, oh, is this plus a revenue share? They say 10 grand plus a revenue share. And you're like, well, I'm not doing a revenue share. Okay, cool. Now it's 15 grand. It's just like you just jacked up your price because you're, you're removing something. So either way, you mean you either get the revenue share or you don't, but you get a higher upfront fee. And it's like, there's, there's like almost no negative to me to include it. And of course you can change it and do bonuses. But to me, it's like the simplest thing to add just to make more money like, like that. Yeah, but the, the bonuses would still be around achieving those KPI metrics because I see a lot of, let's just say more creative, right? If you have more of a creative agency where you were like, I'm, I'm actually not really as close to the money. Let's say you do short form content or you do a VSLs or you do s something that's not exactly money driven. Yeah. Directly. Direct money driven, which, yeah. which it is. Well, what I would do in those scenarios is, okay, well, what are the metrics that they're at now? Okay, what are the metrics that they want to be at? So let's just say they're at like a 10% conversion and they want to be at a 15%. Okay, well, you could say, well, at, at every, at 12.5%, I get a bonus of X. And when I hit 15%, I get a bonus of Y. And that's very normal for businesses to pay out because they have executives in their team, like operations directors, who aren't responsible for closing deals, who still get paid quarterly bonuses and commissions. So you're actually operating more in line with how they operate. Yeah. And guess what? <laughs> if you don't know what to do, ask. Okay, well, how do you incentivize your team members? How do you pay bonuses? How do you pay commissions? How do you set targets? How, because they want, the, the reason why you pay bonuses, we wouldn't bring on a sales guy if we weren't paying him commission. We want to pay people commission. Actually, we, we recently changed one of our lead account managers package to be heavily based around commission rather than base. And they, she already had commission, right? But when we changed it to be more commission over base, the uptick in her performance over the last month has been so much higher, Take a much more responsibility and accountability for the work that, that, that's been done. We, we've seen it with one of our recent suppliers who we brought on board who pitched us a really high retainer. And we said, look, like we wanna work with you, we'll still give you a nice retainer, but we also want to reduce the retainer and pay some revenue share immediately he was like okay well we need to get this done this done this done because there's a there's more of an alignment between both parties and when it comes into account managing and the relationship if you are equals and you're both working towards the same thing rather than the client thinking oh well i'm having a terrible month and jordan and jacob are still making x from me versus oh, and then you the other way around is i've just made that client 400k and I got paid 3k for it that's when resentment can start to to build and I think if you can align the incentives initiatives goals targets and speak about them honestly then when stuff goes wrong and clients like I'm pissed off yeah I'm pissed off as well like I want to make money yeah. yeah I think it's the the partnership approach is kind of overlooked in many instances where you, you do switch from that being like, oh, I'm a supplier, I'm gonna give you services, I'm, I'm kind of the outside. And the problem is with that is like, you're the first person they cut. Cause like, it's much easier to cut an external supplier than it is an, an internal team member. There's a lot more laws and regulations around that. But if you can go in there and you're almost like seen as an internal team member, and obviously you can have m many of these clients though, so you're not really, but it's just so much more aligned with what they're already doing, yeah. what they're familiar with, and also what the business wants. It's like, okay, well, actually, I'm not thinking about, oh, let me just cut that immediately because it's like, it's actually- No, there's like, a relationship. Yeah. There. There's a personal relationship. You're not just looked at as a, <laughs> as as a this, number. There's this thing on the side that's yeah. like trying to get some stuff working that you're kind of in it together. Yeah. And well, it, when you're paying a lot for something, you're more invested. Yeah. Like when you bought your watch in comparison to a, 
another watch that you had, what, what would you be more concerned about yeah. looking after? Yeah, yeah. And that's just a, a small like thing that's insignificant. Never mind someone who's growing your business. Yeah. And bigger businesses will just pay, oh, let's, let's test it for 2K, 3K. That's, that's I, I'm not going to say it, it's pocket change to them. Yeah. But you're not close enough to the business to really impact and learn and grow. And let's be honest, right? Why, why do most people get into running an agency, a growth partner business, make money online, right? Because they want to make money. And if you can do this, you'll make more money in the short term, but also the skills that you're building, the people who you're meeting, how you're developing in a, as a person is going to be the thing that allows you to make wealth in the long term. Yeah, and I think the the skills element is overlooked because when you're delivering a service, you may learn one skill. And like that's great. You can go be an expert in, in one thing, but like you're still always gonna be capped because there's a limit on those kind of opportunities. But when you go in there and you're actually like, I'm helping someone to grow, you learn just such a variety of different skills all at one point that is gonna basically allow you just to go and do whatever you want. So whether it is you want to go build a SaaS or you want to become a core seller, you know. Yeah, we, we, but we've seen that with some of our growth partners already. Some have went deeper into to software. Some have started doing more consultancy side, some more like done for you service elements, but they wouldn't have been able to do that if they weren't in the business. Yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah, and you spot the opportunities by being in it every single day and like hands on like here's what this looks like. Let me see, you can start to notice things. And that's really what Alex Becker did to build High Rose. Like he was running ads and he, he just noticed that like what his Stripe account said and what Facebook said were just so polar opposite. And he's like, okay, so where's the fucking mismatch? Figured out his Facebook's reporting, found a way to fill that gap and then kind of plugged it with both Stripe and the, the ads manager and then went on to build a company that is worth over 200 million and just sold for 110 mil. And he did that in like three years. And it's, it's that, those kind of opportunities. And of course, that's a, an extreme one, but it's very possible that you can, you can see where that product market fit is and what people really want once yeah. you're doing it, once you're hand on in there. Yeah, and with AI, the ease to be able to, I'm not saying build a $200 million company, but the <laughs> ease to be able to implement tools to enhance your delivery, make delivery better, to spin off, to start licensing and things just, out. Even the time and effort that you're spending on it. It's gonna, it's gonna revolutionize growth businesses. Yeah. If any of that craziness makes sense to you at all, feel free to book a call with a member of our team below who can talk you through what it would be like to work with us on a one-to-one -one basis and share with you a little bit about what we're doing with some of our clients currently. See ya. Mm -hmm.